Monday. That went to from 1.30 in the afternoon to 7.30 a.m. now. We started the Revelation series <clears throat> for the first time on the radio um, in, in, uh, in conjunction with that time change from 1.30 to, to 7.30. So we're certainly glad glad for that. I should have a whole lot more whole lot more people listening, and I think it'll lead to a whole lot more visitors coming through the doors. But anyhow, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, a popular segment here of verses. We're going to be looking at the first 15 verses. <clears throat> it says, To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. Now the next verse is a very interesting. It's a thesis that he's developing and what he was just saying by these different seasons. He concludes with this. What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he hath set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work of God maketh from beginning to the end. I know there is no good in them, but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. I know that whatsoever God doeth, now this is key, 14 and 15 is, is establishing what he is driving at from the very first verse. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it, that men should fear before him. That which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. We ask your blessing upon the service tonight. We pray that you'd be glorified and honored, Lord, in all that is said. Lord, I pray that, I beg you for your mercy and your grace, Lord, that the truth that we see here would help us would draw us closer to you, and that you would do the work that needs to be done in our life here this evening. Lord, we need you. Please bless and work. Again, change us and draw us closer to you. If there's anyone here who is not saved, Lord, we certainly do pray for their salvation. Lord, please work. I pray and ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. One of the most precious things that we have, more than gold or silver, your bank account, your career, anything else, is time. Um... There's, there is no commodity you have. There's nothing you possess that is more important than you than time. You can lose money and earn it back. You, you can have wealth and have it taken away. And then that wealth, though, you can earn back. But once time is gone and passed, it's over with. There is nothing you can do to earn it back. It's done. doesn't matter how much money you have. It's over with. That moment is gone. This moment that we're in right now that each of us has chosen to assemble here at the Independent Baptist Church is a simple moment in time. But once it's done, it's past. It'll never come back again. So there's, uh, there's a sense of vanity and a, a, uh, where, uh, uh, where it's futile when we begin to look at life from that simple perspective. I think of the moment when Rachel turned three years old. Where'd she go? She was sitting right there. She's, oh, now she's up there. She moved on me. Today she turns 26. Is that right? 26 years old today. And, but that moment when she was three is gone. That's over with. It's, 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 it, that moment was there for that brief, that brief moment, and it's completely gone, never to come back again. Just like now she turns 26, 
it'll be over with after today. You cannot get time back. And that leaves man in an odd position because there's, there's what Solomon, we're going to see, is driving at is based on that fact that you can't get time back. And because we're in time. It'll all make sense here shortly. Now, God is not in time. This is important. All right? This is where the preacher here is going to find meaning in life because God is not in time. These seasons do not apply to him, <clears throat> he is outside of time, he is in eternity. That is the thesis he was driving at as he gets to verses 14 and 15. This is why the Bible can say that Christ was slain before the foundation of the world, and it's exactly correct. Because God is in eternity. We, right now, are subject to time. We're in it. <clears throat> and the time that we have is short. It's as a vapor, appeareth for a while and vanisheth away. We all know that. We all see how fast time goes. 80 years goes like that. It does. I, I still can't believe that I'm 50 right now. <clears throat> Not only is it short, and this is where Solomon's driving at, because we're in time, and it's only because we're in time, that this next truth is, is, is that this next uh, 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 point I'm making is true. And that is, it is subject to change. If you're in time, change will occur. You can't stop it. Outside of time, that's not true. We're going to see that's what Solomon's driving at. But as long as we're in time, change is a part of life. Man, man is, is striving at, just like the preacher did, just like Solomon did, at seeking and finding some source of true, solid stability. But it wasn't possible. Because he's in time. <clears throat> change happens. Life is full of change. I remember growing up and change occurring. As many of us, I usually struggled with change, but I had to get used to it. A change happened a lot. I remember being six years old and one day living with mom and dad, and the next day I was with mom in an apartment. That's, that's how that went. I didn't understand why. I didn't know why. I was very easygoing anyhow. It didn't, really didn't matter to me. Okay, this is where we're at now. Um, but that was a change. And then one of the bigger changes that I had first major struggle dealing with was fifth grade. We moved to another town, middle of the school year, and I walk into a brand new school, packed 50 students in my class, middle of the day walking in there. That was no fun at all. all I didn't know one person in there. It was a massive change that occurred. Not only that, the next year, in sixth grade, I'd have to do the exact same thing again. Pick up, go to a brand new town, a brand new public school, and enter into those same classrooms not knowing anybody. Life was about change, and I was learning that at a very young age. Nothing stayed the same. There were seasons in life. Ended up staying in there, but then life would change again. I would enter the United States Air Force. Things changed when I entered the military. Shortly after that, children came along. Life changed. It wasn't too long I was in the ministry. And then Papua New Guinea came. Things changed. And then back again to Alaska. Life changed. And those moments that I've gone through, I can never get back again. Much of our joy in life depends on how we accept the seasons of change that come upon us. For some, they don't want to leave the grief, even though it's a time to rejoice. For some, when it's a time to rejoice, when it's time for grief, they don't want to leave the rejoicing. And it'll all make sense here. <clears throat> Relationships change. Events occur that necessitate changes in relationship. I think of, of course, Daniel and Sharon. You know, life changed for them. Three years ago, neither of them seen this taking place. They didn't even know each other. 
circumstances in life constantly change. Our text is about the time we have and the changes in life and trying to find meaning knowing that's going to occur. Again, man tries to find stability in life, but it is not possible at the level that man actually needs apart from God. The word used for time here is very interesting. Uh, There's a few key words we're going to see that are fascinating what the Bible chose to use. The word for time is one of them. It's not speaking of chronological. It's not not what it's speaking about here at all. That's not the word that's used. It's something that is due, that there's purpose behind it, direction, a season. Even though the word season is used, that same word actually has the meaning of season in it itself that's used for time. And it means there's, and of course, what it's driving at is it's not random what occurs. There's purpose behind it. With God, as we're going to see, you can see the beauty in it. Keep in mind, the preacher, when writing this, is looking at the vanity of life. When he's writing this, I think sometimes we read it how it's not meant to be read. He's reading this from a point of vanity, a futility of life, of this being another distress. Because as he concludes, once he gets to verse 9, he, where is there 14 of them here? Once he gets to verse 9, he's like, what profit is there? I'm just spinning my wheels. It doesn't matter what I do, I can't find stability. A new season will come. And how you adjust to those seasons, again, is key to how successful you are in life. You can see it even with, uh, you know, you you hear of these, you know, different generation coming up nowadays, not realizing a, a season has changed where they need to move on and grow up. I mean... I mean, some people just staying home and playing video games till they're 35, 40 years old and not, and not moving on with change. <clears throat> he saw there was time and seasons, but he knew apart from God under heaven, it was all vanity, all his efforts because of change as we're going to see what he would build, would one day come down. It didn't matter in the end, apart from God. So we're going to look at two points here this evening. The seasons that God gives, why, what he gives here in those 14 comparisons, and then the solution God gives to us as we deal with the changes in life. First off, the seasons that are given. Let's look at the first couple of verses here. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. Let me stop there. He starts off here by pairing birth and death, which of course are the boundaries of life. As he introduces this, he's setting the framework down. And he's also given us something that we know without a doubt is providentially of God. You had no say-so in your birth. You didn't get determined if you were born into a rich family or a poor family, a black family or a white family. You had no say-so. It was predetermined by God Almighty. It was something that he set in motion and something that he did. These are both appointed times by God. There's an interesting year when studying this. Year of 1809. I'm going to bring that year up. It's interesting when you think of time to be born. The year of 1809 in the world was a time of war and of battles. It's right in the middle of Napoleon and his conquest. All this began in the Battle of England and of, of the English Channel in 1805. He tried, Napoleon tries to take control of the English Channel. This all ends in 1815 at the Battle of Waterloo. So right in the middle of this in 1809, why the world is seeing nothing but battle and war and wondering what's going to go on, God was seeing babies. It was time to be born. 
Think about this. Right in the middle of this, 1809. Here's who was born in 1809. The Lord knew what he was doing. There would be men born that would change the world. In 1809, William Gladstone was born. He would become one of Great Britain's greatest leaders and prime ministers. Lead, lead that empire to great change. In 1809, Abraham Lincoln was born, who would, of course, become one of the greatest presidents that our country has ever seen. In 1809, this man would change the world, but not for the good. So was Charles Darwin, was born in 1809. In 1809, Chopin was born, who would bring amazing music to the world. In 1809, Oliver Wendell Holmes was born, a man who would be one of the best writers our country has seen, a man who would help change our entire medical system. Before we even have knowledge of germs, he, he came up with an understanding there's something going on. He was studying the amount of women who died during birth and recognized we're spreading something. Something's going on with these infections. And he was the one writing and being mocked for it by the medical community uh, 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 for saying this. But he understood our, our, whole, our whole thinking of what was happening. He said it was so wrong. And he was laying the foundation that would change the medical community. He, too, was born in 1809. So as the world was looking at battles, God was seeing the babies that were born. Death, of course, is also pointed by God. Although sin certainly can cause someone to take their life earlier, but even that God knew. As we see in Hebrews 9, 27, you have an appointed time to die and meet your Creator. And certainly if God orders our steps as the Bible says He does, you better believe He orders this step. He goes on to say in that same verse, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. Of course, this is, we think of a farmer when it comes to something like this, plant and, and, and plucking up. But we see God in this. This is from God's perspective, not a farmer's perspective. You think of when he planted Israel in their land, led them out of Egypt, of course, first showed it to Abraham, this is going to be your land. And then when they finally get planted into it after, after the years in the wilderness coming out of Egypt, all that took place, yet there was also going to be a time when they would be plucked up by the Assyrians and the Babylonians. There's a time to be planted and a time to pluck. Change had occurred. A time to kill, to kill and a time to heal. Now, this is not dealing with murder, of course. This is dealing with justified killing. There are times when we can be in a situation when we cause the death of another. You don't know if tonight if somebody's going to break into your house and threaten your family, and you're going to be in a season of time to kill. At the same time, the next day, who knows, you might be in a time to heal. You might be put yourself in a position where you're the one that's saving a life. I, I think back when I just, just finished preaching on a Sunday morning. The work in Kudu Kudu was fairly new, maybe a year old at this time. And uh, one of the men from the village came running up and they said that a lady has just given birth and something's really, really wrong. And so we got in my truck and we went over there. It was just about a half mile down the road where she was. She was on the, the beach area there and she was bleeding out. It was obvious. She was just bleeding out. And uh, Marianne had grabbed the newborn, the umbilical cord still attached. And she, she got in the bed of the truck. That's not where I want her. That's where they're going to put her, though. That's, that's where she was. And we take, off, we take off for the aid station. And it was about an hour, hour and ten minute drive on a horrible bumpy road. And I am flying down this road. And she is sitting in the bed of my truck. But I'd, I'd ask there. They, they had what, their, their midwives there. You know, who deliver the baby. They're not trained midwives, but there are ladies in the village who will deliver the babies. And I'd ask the midwife as she got in the truck, do I need to go easy for her or do I need to go fast? She said, no, you go fast as you can. And so flew, flying down there. And at one point in time, there was a coconut that had downed in the middle of the, the little dirt road and had to veer off into the bush, not hitting any trees. And she's in the back of this truck. And coming back onto it. And remember, she just delivered a baby an hour before this, if that. And anyhow, we get there. When I get out of my truck at the H, I look in the bed of my truck. It's just a pool of blood. All of you, you don't see the bottom of my truck. She's still bleeding out and really weak. 
And uh, anyhow, they got her in. The, the nurses took her. I went and washed out the bed of the truck, and they saved her life. She did not end up bleeding out. And the little baby's name was, was it McGovern or Terry? Terry, is that what it was? So the little baby was baby Terry, what they ended up naming that little baby. <clears throat> So there's a time to kill and a kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up, it says. As with life, where there's a time to kill and a time to heal, so with our labors is there a time of building up and a time of tearing down. Solomon built, of course, amazing structures. The temple, his palace. And that's just not the only structures he built. But he built, he built amazing structures. But of course... The, all of them would come down. All of them. You can think of the Berlin, Berlin Wall, which built, I, somebody could probably tell me the year was, I know it was right before 1950, 48, 49, the Berlin Wall was built, coming down in 1989. A time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Let me put these two together for time's sake here. They're both the same, but one is obviously giving more emphasis as to what occurs in life. We will all experience tears. We will all experience grief. We will all experience joy. So we have these seasons for both that God gives. Sometimes, again, we have trouble with these seasons in changing with them. There are those who are in sorrow who refuse to let go of it, even though the season has passed. There's a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. Um, the Lord provided a perfect illustration of this in my house last night. I laughed when it happened. We were watching Judah last night. He was in the house, and, and he was collecting stones from outside. He put them in this bucket, and he walks in with them. And we're in the living room, and he grabs them. And they're good-sized stones, not little, about like that big. And he launches it through the living room. <laughs> and I laughed. I said, this is not a time to cast stones. It's the time to gather, but this is not the time to cast stones. You can go outside, that's the time you can cast stones. <clears throat> and no, I'm not about to spank that little guy. It's just, it's just not going to happen. <laughs> There's a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, dealing with hugging. I find it funny that Solomon wrote this because he had about a thousand wives. I don't think he knew what it was like to refrain from embracing. I mean, think about this. Let's just try and put a time to, I guess he probably had to marry someone in batches. Because if he didn't marry him in batches, I mean, literally, he had to get engaged one week, marry the next, honeymoon the next, and then and get engaged the very next week. I mean, that's how he'd have to do that to get to a thousand. <clears throat> But a more proper example of this is Joseph before his brothers. When they came searching for the food, there was a time to refrain from embracing. And then there was the time to embrace them. There's a time to get and a time to lose. There's a time for gain and there's a time for loss. No doubt Solomon maybe thought about his investments and his economic dealings with other nations and his merchant ships and all that he had established with the gains and losses that came with that. These times come. One day you have wealth, the next day it's gone. One day you have nothing, and the next day you have much. <clears throat> you can think of all the stores that went under when this last virus hit. You go back to December, if you thought all these people were going to be, if they thought they're going to be out of business, oh no, things are going well, coming through the Christmas season. Yet the season changed. Life is about change. And then there's a time to keep and a time to cast away. When we were leaving for, getting ready to leave for deputation in New Guinea, so we were over at Ivan Drive where we just moved Daniel out from and, and selling most of the things we had. We had planned on shipping a 20 foot container over to New Guinea, so we kept, uh, we kept some key things, but selling most of what we had. And we were holding a garage sale, selling a lot of events, and a neighbor boy came over um, wanting a particular item. Do you have that picture ready? Let's, let's go, go ahead and show me that picture real quick. <clears throat> I 
Now, this is, several, this is before I moved up to Alaska. This would have been actually right before we moved. That's Heather right there. And she, what is she, five, six years old at this point in time, with a Tweety bird that just got one at Cedar Point. House right next to you, that bigger house at the, at the corner there, he had come over and he wanted to buy Tweety Bird. And so we're right there, I'm negotiating, I'm practically going to give it to him right there. And it's, I mean, the Tweety Bird was just huge. And so I'm getting ready to sell this, and all of a sudden Heather's tugging on me over and over and over, over and over and over. And she said, Can I talk to you? Yes. And so we go back to her room and she just starts crying. Please don't sell Tweety. Please don't sell Tweety. Please, please don't sell Tweety. And now I'm crying with her. I have tears coming down. And, and I, go, I tell the boy, Tweety's no longer for sale. And so Tweety Bird went all the way to New Guinea. And he came in that little tiny container that we, not the container we came, we came back with a small crate. Guess what was in that crate? Now, what I had to do to get him in that crate was a little bit different. I had to remove every bit of that stuffing. So he was folded up to about this size to get him into that crate. But that was a time to keep and not to cast away. And you want to know how the Lord used that? When we were there, and, and, and I, still th- I can still see that moment as, it's, as if it's happening right now, how the Lord used it. When we finally got our container, which took a couple of months, it, was, it beat us to the nation. It, it was already in country before I ever got on a plane and flew there. But it took us months to get it where we were at. And so it finally comes in that, during that first year, which is just incredibly difficult and all the battles. And the very first truck comes down with Puce, who had filled up stuff from my container. I gave him access to it. I hadn't even been in it yet. And he comes down with a load of stuff. The very first thing out of that truck was Tweety. <laughs> very first thing. Nothing else before. He pulled that out of the back of the truck, and Heather saw that goes running right at it, grabs Tweety and runs right to her room and stays with Tweety right there. But that was a time that I knew that was a time to keep and not cast away. There's a time to rend and a time to sow. The thing that, of course, that comes to mind here would be the veil of the curtain of the temple. There's a time when that was to be sewn up, but the day came when that thing was to be rendered apart. There's a time to speak and a time to keep silence, or as I told Bob in my translation, a time to shut it. <laughs> Proverbs, of course, has a lot to speak on this. The book of James has a lot to stay on this point. Knowing when to speak and when, non- and when not to speak, the tongue certainly needs a measure of discipline about it. It's not about letting your flesh be in control and let the words fly. It's about letting God to be in control of your life and using wisdom of knowing when to speak and when to be quiet. And there are times to keep silent. There are times to speak up when you have an opportunity to present the gospel or a time to keep silence when you're recognizing this is casting my pearls before swine. Or, husbands, when your wife says, does this make me look fat? It might be a time to keep silent. Well, actually, you better speak. <laughs> I take that back. Don't keep silent at that one either. That's, there's no wisdom in that. Just smile and nod. <laughs> there's a time to love and a time to hate. I'm going to put this also with the last one, a time of war and a time of peace. One, of course, is dealing with that at a personal level. One is dealing with that at a very public level. Love, of course, has a time when it should be flowing from us. Love is a time, a season that we're in often and we should be in often. With your spouse, with your kids, with someone who needs help. Maybe it's a neighbor. But that's certainly a season that should be flowing from us. But there are seasons of hate, too. Now, you keep this in context with the Bible. Don't allow the sin of hatred and use this to justify it. Because you would be wrong. The things we are to hate are the things that God hates. It's in that perspective that this is given. So that would be the things that you hate are the things that keep you from serving God as you should. The things that hinder your life from glorifying God as you should, those are the things that should produce a hatred. Having a passion against the things 
that hinder us with our walk with God or that oppose God. Now from there, he goes through all the changes in life because there's all these different seasons. It's not stable. So he comes up to verse 9. Hmm. I wonder if I should get through this or not right now. Yeah, I think we can do it. Let's go to verse 9. What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. He's he's going on here. He's saying, what profit is there? All this, there's these different seasons. You know, if you build something, the time's going to come to take it down. If, if, you, if it's a time of gain, just wait. There's going to be a season of loss that occurs. Oh, if you're happy right now, don't worry. There's a, there's a season of grief that is coming to you. And he sees the futility that's in it. What profit is there? What am I doing? I mean, it's just going to change. So I'm going to build these buildings, but they're going to come down. There's no stability, no true, genuine stability. Change will come. I'm in time, he's saying. It's these different seasons that come and go. I'm aging. But in 11 is where he starts to see the solution. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. I know there is no good in him that is in his works, but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor is the gift of God. He's relating this back to his conclusion from 9 and 10 of what he saw. It's, it's not the best summation here what he's talking about, and, and his main point is going from 11 to 14 and 15. He's almost saying in 12 and 13 that, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, he's saying almost to the point where it's just about materialism. I, I'm just going to have to enjoy that moment knowing joy still comes from God, and that's it. But look here at 14 now. I know that. All right, here's, here's the reason he's thinking now on God. All right. Whatsoever God doeth, this is different. This is different than his labor, than what he's facing in time. I know that whatsoever God doeth, It shall be forever. If he plants something, it's not going to be plucked up. If he he gathers something, it's not going to be cast away. It's permanent. It's lasting. It's stable. No change. I am the Lord God. I change not. Nothing. Look at this. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. Verse 15, great verse. That which hath been is now, and that which is to to be hath already been. And God requireth that which is past. He's saying, listen, God is not in time. He's not subject to the seasons that I am listing. That's what he recognizes. He's seeing the solution that God gives to the futility of life that he has seen because time, time comes, and because of time, it's seasons of changes. Nothing's going to last because he's viewing life under heaven apart from God. But in God, what he realizes, but he says, but wait, what God does is forever. It doesn't change. Nothing can be taken from it. Nothing can be added to it. And and he knows this is what man's looking for, which is what he was saying in verse 11. God hath made everything beautiful in his time. At first, we might not be able to see it, where the beauty is going to come from. But think of Genesis 1, 2, and the earth was without form and void, but beauty would come of it. We live in a very unstable world, as we see in our news right now. We can see how rapidly and quickly things can change. Obviously, any man who thinks life is going to be unending happiness or that his current circumstances are all is going great and he thinks he's going to carry this to the end of his days 
is sadly wrong. A season will come. The phone call from a doctor will come. The news will come from a policeman. We go through seasons. <clears throat> if living apart from God, man will fail to see the beauty, the beauty that is in life when God gives those seasons because, as the word tells us, the word that is used there for it, there's purpose behind it all. But apart from God, you'll never see that beauty. To you, it'll just look futile and vanity and empty and nothing. But if you begin to see it, your life with God, there's beauty in all of it. <clears throat> if you remove God from all the change in this world, you will be miserable. I mean, all the are you can see where you can see his point when you when you try and view what he's saying apart from God, you see his point. Why am I doing all this? What does it really matter? He would be right. But when you put God in the equation, that changes everything. Because as you endure change, you understand it's not about the moment that you're in. It's about the God that you're serving who's not in time. There's a big difference there. We are not to get caught up in the seasons of change and allow those to control us. They will come and they will go. We are to get caught up in the voice of the one who says, be still and know that I am God. It is with God we can see the beauty in what he is accomplishing. <clears throat> we learn in all that we do, in the seasons of life that come, even though change occurs, God still uses it with a purpose. He balances. He balances so we can learn to praise Him in one event, and in other conditions, learn to trust Him. He balances. As a result, we draw closer to him. Now, all this change in life and all that appears to be vanity, with God, though, it gives great purpose and completely remo removes the idea that life is vanity and is futile. You can see purpose because it's not about the circumstances of life, but the creator who gave the life. And orders it according to his purpose. This is where contentment is learned. In this. In life, one day you're on top of the world, but the next day your world comes crashing down. This can lead a person apart from God to thinking, what is the purpose in life? Why try? Look, you can think of right now of, of, of different store owners across American big cities who maybe spent 50 years to build something, and it's gone. If that's all they know, you know what their thought is? What a waste of time. Because that's all they know. That's Solomon's point. Another season just occurred, and it's gone. And if that's all you have, what profit is there? But what he sees in God is, well, wait a second. With God, there is no change. What man tries to establish from, with retirement accounts and, and what are they, 501s and 301s or somebody help me, 401s, 401ks and all this stuff. And try, what he's trying to produce is a measure of stability in his life. He's trying, to, he's trying to have that, yet it can change at a moment. But with God, that's not the case. Not at all. What he does, what, in other words, what man is looking for is eternity. Being outside of time, where there's no change, there's no seasons. It's the stability he craves. 
And that's what Solomon says in verse 11. Let's go back to that. By the way, example, I don't have time to dive into their life right now. I've done it enough. I don't think there's any visitors here. But great, great examples of this are Joseph and Paul. Great examples of this. Of how they went through such... Job, we could throw Job into this as well. Incredible circumstances, but because they understood the sovereignty of God and they lived in the eternal and not in the temporal, they were good. Look at verse 11. 11, 14, and 15 are just incredible verses. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. I've covered that, but look at this. Also, He hath set the world in their heart. That's us. So that that no man can find out the work of God maketh from beginning to the end. Let's deal with that for a second, because this is part of the solution that God has given to man. He knows apart from him, they're going to see how futile it is and vanity, and it's empty and it's nothing. It's like, like, again, trying to eat the wind when you're hungry. He says, but I put something in their heart. Now, the word for world here is not dealing with the world system and the evil of the world and this physical world. That's not what it's dealing with at all. The word is used about 438 times in the Bible. Three of the times, it's translated world. This is one of them here, once in Psalms. I can't remember the other one. It's also translated as everlasting, eternal, um, without end, never, never. It has the idea, now get this, what he's saying is this. It says, what I've put into them, in this world, is the wonder of the universe itself, eternity. I've put it in them. And you see that. You see that in sciences. You see that throughout all of world history. That drive that's there. Now, as he says there, even though, so that, that's going to that's gonna lead to that desire for eternity, for God to learn of him. Now, it's not possible to learn him from beginning to end. <laughs> what we have, the sin nature, he is so infinite, we cannot possibly learn from beginning to end. But we can learn. And so he said, what I have done is put in their hearts so they'll see it isn't, it isn't vanity. There's purpose behind it. There's a creator. There's a curiosity given by God to search and be amazed. And that's true. Isn't it amazing? You can think back in school, even in, even in public school and sciences, when you were learning of things like, wow, that's amazing. Like the human eye. Isn't that just incredible? I can't remember everything. It, I really haven't studied this since high school. I don't think I did it in college at all to study the Bible. Where it, like it comes in upside down and it flips it over. Up in your eyes. So I don't know if everybody's actually upside down in reality or not. I'm not sure. But just how it processes it, how it runs it through the brain, through the optic nerve, it is incredible. Or hearing. Just a series of vibrations right now that's making perfect sense to me. Unless Bob's talking. (laughs) Then it's just annoying. But he puts this hunger in man for eternity. You want to know why? Because it's not time. What man does for eternity never changes. Never. <clears throat> Look what he says in verse 14 and 15. I'll finish here. Only a couple more minutes. I'm, I'm just about done. Only four more pages of notes. Now look at this, 11, 14, and 15 is where he's driving at, where the key is here. He says, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Now remember, Solomon is distressing over what he did and how it had no permanence. But he knows what God does is forever. Nothing can be put to it, no worries there, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him in all, desiring him. Verse 15, that which hath been is now. This is dealing with God, not in time. And that which is to be hath already been. And God requireth that which is past. Again, God's not in time. He's apart from it. 
what Solomon, what the preacher is seeing in God is what man needs, what he craves. You, you know, how, when we established our government in the United States of America, you know what we were trying to create? Stability. A sense that we could do something with life. Trying to form a government that would allow that to take place. The pursuit of... Know what we're finding out? We weren't successful. Things change. Things change. But when you live in eternity, that never changes. In other words, do you understand that the gates and the walls in heaven will never come down? Ever. Do you understand what God has built there will never come down? Do you understand there that that if you're in eternity with him, that your body, that that when when we're in his presence, that new body we have, will never need healing, ever. No sickness, no crying, no pain. It's apart from time. No change. It is eternity. See, what we need is with God. So the futility that he was seeing, once again, is the very thing that's driving him to God and saying, listen, I've got to get back to God. Because apart from him, all my labor is nothing. It doesn't matter how great and how grand as he looked at his palace and he looked at the temple. One day it's coming down. And that's true. One day it's coming down. But with God, that's where there is no change. What he does is forever. It's not going to be added to. It's not going to be taken away from. So our conclusion is, of course, to live for eternity. Therefore, then, then, like I said earlier, then we're not simply living for the moment. And as we go through seasons of change, we can have peace and contentment because our purpose is not in the moment. It's in the God who is our creator, who can use those things for a purpose, whether it's teaching us to praise him or to trust him. But we live for him and to that end with heads bowed and eyes closed.